Hello, everybody. Welcome to our midweek Bible study deep water webinar, Wednesday deep water webinar. Um, we'll give some people a couple more minutes to jump online. I see there are some people trying to get on, so um, let's give them a couple minutes. In the meantime, let's have prayer because we've got some things to praise the Lord about. Uh, looks like most of our nation is starting to open, and uh, we've got some good reports on people health-wise. Christina Cup's dad that we prayed for, Bill Menz, he had heart surgery today. They did some bypasses on him, and she said everything went perfectly, which is exactly how we prayed. We prayed everything would go perfectly, and it did. Pray, so praise the Lord about that. It is going to be a good lesson tonight. We are going to believe that the Lord is going to teach us some things from his word. We're going to be in Exodus. We're going to talk a little bit more about Moses tonight. Uh, actually, quite a bit more about Moses, but also about the children of Israel, because the Lord comes. And it's important for us to learn. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you. We lift you up and give you glory and honor. Father, you are worthy of our praise. We just want to thank you for helping Brother Men's in healing him up, for delivering him, Lord God, as the doctors worked on him. Fathers, they did their best work, and that's exactly what we prayed for, Lord God, and you didn't deliver anything less. So we thank you for it and praise you for it. Father, we ask you, Lord God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, to help us tonight help our country tonight, help us recover and pull out of this thing, Lord God, that fear would diminish and the people of God would raise up with strength, Lord God, that would be contagious to everybody else. Father, we thank you and we praise you for a good lesson tonight, a lesson filled with faith, a lesson filled with hope, and a lesson filled with joy. And we just praise you and honor you in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, let's get started. The um, we, we've been studying about Moses and about finding God in the Old Testament. And boy, are there some lessons that speak right to our heart. I mean, they're just about us. So we want to get to one of those tonight in the book of Exodus, if my screen will change. Huh. Oh, there we go. Wrong place. There we go again. All right, book of Exodus, chapter 13, verses 17 through 18. Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. The Philistines didn't like the Hebrew people at all. They were ready to already go to war with them before they even got there. So uh, God says, hey, unless they change their mind, you know, the people change their mind at some point in time and they, they see a little war and they all get, you know, cold feet. I'm going to take them around a different way. So he takes them a much longer route. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. Now, this really starts to tell us something about the character of God, what he knows about us, and, and how he reacts to us. You see, he's already anticipating the children of Israel making some bad decisions. And the, the first bad decision that they'll make is when things get a little tough. Or war, they start seeing war, they're going to, you know, chicken out and go home, which in their case would be back to Egypt. So the Lord tells them or directs them around uh, a, into a back way. And he really knows us better than we know ourselves. When the children of Israel left Egypt, they were gung ho, they were ready to, to rock. And the Lord knows where they're at. He knows their heart. They haven't seen war. They haven't seen any of their people killed or anything like that other than by the Egyptians. 
And so it would be better to go back in Egypt. In fact, we're going to find out a little bit later on. They keep saying that. Well, why did he bring us out here? Why did he lead us this way? Why hadn't he given us any food? We should have gone back to Egypt. They're always thinking about going back to Egypt, which really speaks about us as believers. The first thing that happens for a lot of people right after they get saved, as soon as they start running to all kinds of problems or persecution or ridicule or people making fun of them or something else for becoming a Christian, they they want to go back to Egypt. They want to get back to the world. Well, you know, life was easier there. I was familiar with that. I, I, I knew the turf. So the Lord says, I'm not going to give them opportunity to do that. Man, I wish he'd do that with some folks today. Just don't give them opportunity. Oh, now I'm froze again. Romans 8, 28, and 29. Great verses. This is what we should know. This is what we ought to know as believers. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus did not intend for us to be a a secondborn. He intended for us to be, him to be the first of the firstborn, and we to be the next of the firstborn. We're all firstborn. And that's the language here. In the original Greek language, that is how that plays out. He's the firstborn among many firstborn. Now, these verses, they continue by stating the obvious, uh, an obvious verse for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? If all things work together for good to those that love God, called according to his purpose, then if God's for us, who can be against us? Which is exactly what the nation of Israel was going to find out. If God's for them, who can be against them? What other nation, what other people, what other, uh, what other thing can be against them? You say, well, pastor, yeah, but we know there were persecutions and thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of Christians died. Yeah, sure there was. There sure was. But that didn't mean God wasn't for them. It didn't mean that all things didn't work out together for their good. It's all perspective. If we see this life as the finite of everything, then yeah, it, you're, you're right. It's, it could be a terrible thing. Life could be, could be devastating. But if you see this life as just something that ends physically, but continues in the spirit, that our life is infinite, in the very foundation of our core of our being, we're infinite beings. Then this life, the end of this life, doesn't really make all that much difference. In fact, it's the shortest period of our lifespan is the physical life. Think about that for a minute. God knows every decision we're going to make. And he makes provision for our decision. God's concern is that when we see things getting rough, we might turn and desire Egypt again rather than him. In Exodus 14, 1 through 4, take a look at these verses. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now, the Lord knows the heart of our enemies. However, his main concern is that they come to know that he alone is God. That's God's main concern. He's wanting to show himself strong on behalf of the nation of Israel, but he's wanting to show himself strong to the Egyptians. Now, it's interesting what he does here with the Egyptian people. 
because he backs them up into a pigeonhole. I mean, seriously, he backs them up into a place where they don't have an out. They can't go left. They can't go right. The Red Sea is behind them. The only, that's, that's the safest option they have to escape is the Red Sea. Can you imagine that? The safest bet you have to get out of something is, is a terrible, turbulent sea. It, it wasn't just a calm sea like ice that they could just go across. The Red Sea is, is um, the terrain under it is very difficult. They knew it wasn't something they could negotiate, especially with women and children and, and cattle and, and all the goods they had. So here God puts them in a position. Think about this. They are in a position where they see their only out is to surrender to an enemy that hates them, that's already abused them. That's their only out. Now, on the other hand, Pharaoh is seeing them, and he's saying, look at these knuckleheads. The land has bewildered them. They have put themselves in a box. God hardens his heart. Instead of him just waiting there for them to come and surrender because they can't go anywhere, there's nothing there. It's desert. And he puts them in a box, and instead of leaving them there, he says, let's go in and get them. It, he might have been really cavalier, John Wayne type, you know. Aha, uh -huh. let's go get them. You never know, right? You just don't know. I know I'm being corny tonight. Now, as we continue this story on, and I froze again. There we go. As we continue this on, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Because Moses went to him. Moses went to him and said, Lord, what's up? And the Lord says, Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. The Lord's always 100%. He is always in the teaching mode. Yeah, dad, good point. My dad says, I think this shows the Lord knows that everyone is, is thinking. Everyone is always thinking. They may not be right thoughts. They may, they may be really dumb thoughts, you know. Uh, they may be absolutely brilliant thoughts, but all of us are thinking through. Uh, human nature does that it, as well as um, instinctively. We have a, an instinct to survive. So instinctively, we would be looking for an out. If we're backed into a corner, we are looking for an out. The Lord's always in the teaching mode. Here, he is firm with Moses. He's absolutely firm with him. The, the way is always forward with God. God does not go backward. I remember when somebody told me one time, uh, the late Dr. Lester Summerall, uh, who was just a faith nut, um, he put in, he didn't have that big of a house up in South Bend, Indiana, but he put in a circular driveway in his front yard and he would only pull in because he never backed, he never wanted to go backward. He said, I don't go backward for anything and I'm not going to go backward at my own house. So he put a circular driveway in. Well, it is kind of like that with us. You know, the Lord, the direction for the Lord is always forward. He'll give them a path that will take them through the sea, not around it. Now, what do they think? They think we can't get around this sea. We don't have any place to go. How often have we been in our life in that way where we're backed up? And by the way, the sea in Scripture a lot of times represents something that separates you from God. It, it, the sea is representative in Scripture of something that separates man from something he wants or separates man from God. It is always, the sea is always something that talks about division. In the book of Revelation, it says there was no more sea. What's that mean? There's no more division. Nothing else is going to separate us from the love of God. Nothing else is going to separate us from the heart of God. Nothing else is going to separate us from the blessings of God. 
Nothing is going to separate us any longer. We can't see a seat. We can't see a separation. Now, he's going to give them this path that they can walk across. Now, they don't know that at the time, but God knows it. How often are we sitting with our backs to the wall, or in this case, to the sea? And God tells us, hey, go forward. And you say, how can I go forward? Do you see what's in front of me? I can't. I don't have the abilities. Remember what he told Moses, though, about that rod. He said, take that rod in your hand. By that, I'm going to deliver you. And he absolutely did. Now, Moses struck the water, turned to blood. He struck the ground and turned to, to, uh, to sand fleas or gnats. He, he, uh, he did all kinds of things that were miraculous things with that rod in his hand. He tells Moses, tell the children of Israel to go forward. But you lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and, uh, and divide it. Now, can you imagine the thought that's in Moses' head at the time? With God, listen, you got to go forward. You cannot surrender because it's, it's in our instinct. When we have an opportunity that we think we can survive by, by surrendering, we will surrender. But with God, all things are possible. We're going to confront fears. We're going to confront hurdles in our life. There's going to be things in our Christianity. Sicknesses, diseases, financial upsets. There's going to be all kinds of things that are going to come against us. Emotional hurdles that we're going to have to jump over. And God has already got a, got a plan for us. Now check out 1 Corinthians 15, 56-58. The sting of, of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Even over death, we have victory. The worst case scenario for us is death as far as the physical being. But even in that, we have victory. Sin receives its strength from the, from the law. Paul urges us to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, this work is the spreading of grace through living a faith that is immovable and is unshakable. It's amazing to me how many believers, the first thing that happens in their life, where it just seems like it's it's overwhelming, it's too big. You know, the just like Pharaoh said about the land, perhaps they've been overwhelmed by the land. You know, the, the, the first time that happens, they get shaken. They become very movable. But the work that we have, the life that we have, the faith that we have is immovable and unshakable. We're steadfast going forward with life despite our failings because of Christ we'll always find victory yeah ed we do we have the holy spirit and the holy spirit guess what he's saying go forward right go forward the worst thing that can happen to us in our life is fear fear will stop us from doing anything and everything the biggest fear, and we've seen it happen through this whole coronavirus thing, the biggest fear we have is the fear of the unknown. When we're not familiar with something, when we, when we just don't know, that's the biggest fear because our minds will naturally go to the worst case scenario. But with God, knowing that all things are possible, we don't really have a worst case scenario. If you think about it, Think about what God offers us. We don't have a worst case scenario. And, and that's what this whole story of the children of Israel going through the desert is. It, it is a story of failings of people who continually pick up the worst case scenario. And God continually delivers them. This is a great life that we live. And if we will allow God to take hold of us. Like 1 John uh, 5 says, 
For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who delivers that Jesus, or believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yeah, we do. We let the, the world steal our joy. We, we absolutely do. And our faith. We let, him, we let the world steal our peace. But think of that which overcomes the world is not our faith in faith. But that which overcomes the world is our trust in the unfinished work of Christ. Good point, Mike. Mike says, if we believe and hold fast in faith that Jesus is who he is, we will live forever with him. That's exactly right. And we will do a lot of great exploits here on the earth. We'll do things that you never, you will do things, I promise you, you will do things you never thought you could do. You will have the courage, the ability, you will have the strength, you will have the goods, as they say, to take on all kinds of things you never thought you could take on if you believe that Jesus is who Jesus says he is. Being born of God means to be born of the Spirit of Christ, to have the same Spirit of Christ. That Spirit of Christ went to a cross. What are the odds of looking at that and not being afraid, not having some turmoil, not having something that goes, uh-oh, this, this doesn't look good, you know? This is worse than a bad B movie. Even death cannot prevent his work of life from going forward. Even death can't. The Holy Spirit, listen to this. Think about this for one minute. The Holy Spirit cannot lose. He's never lost. He will never lose. The Holy Spirit cannot lose. That's why Paul can say, oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? Even death cannot prevent the work from going forward. Our worst is still the best. The worst case scenario for us is still the best. And that's all God's telling us through this, this message he's given the children of Israel. Why are you guys crying to me? Raise your staff up. And walk forward. Sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you just have to take some steps forward. Even though the odds and what the advice of everybody around you says, you still have to step forward. Now, listen, uh, disclaimer, do not throw out common sense. God gave that to you as well. But when you live in wisdom, when you seek wisdom, which is the principal thing, by the way, God will lead you and drop people into your place who will give you testimony that you ought to go forward. I mean, remember Paul. Paul had a, a, a well-known prophet go up to him, wrap something around and bind up his hands. He bound up his hands and he told him, going to Jerusalem, I mean, going to uh, Rome, you are going to lose your life. If you continue to Rome, you're going to lose your life. Getting bound up. What did Paul say? Yeah, I know. This is the plan. I'm going forward anyway. Because God told me to go there. I do appreciate your word, but listen, God told me to go there. My slides are taking a little bit of extra time here. Exodus 14, 19 through 20. It, yeah, that's a good verse, Mike. G Mike says, Jesus said, what can man do to us? That's exactly right. What can man do to us? Exodus 14, 19 through 20. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. The Hebrews believed this to be Michael the archangel, that the pillar of fire in, in the cloud was, was Michael the archangel. But many times in the Hebrew writings, we find that it is not Michael the archangel, but Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ. 
So here they're concerned uh, about this cloud and this, this fire, but you know, it changes. Here Jesus is seen by the Egyptians as great darkness, but to Israel, he's the fire that leads them by night to light the way. This is the way it is with those who have no relationship with Christ. They just cannot see it. And the scriptures tell us that. The scriptures tell us that they, they just can't see. They just don't know. To the unbeliever, Christianity is darkness. And until faith begins to arise up in their heart because of the testimony of believers, and, and they start longing for that, because the way God works is he moves people to jealousy. He moves people to want to change. He moves people really to envy what you have, to be jealous of what you have, and then they make a decision to grab hold of what they previously didn't have, and they, they get Christ. They can't understand our peace and our joy. Making prayer seems humorous or a wasteful use of one's time. But to us, the foolish things of God that glorify him are light and magnificence. They are the foolish things that, that we do, lifting our hands, worshiping, singing, all of that stuff. It seems like sometimes nonsense. And yet a lot of people who worship other things other than God they do the same thing. I can remember the first time I ever watched a concert of, with a rock band in, in kind of our modern era. And I, I, all of a sudden, I saw all these people holding their phones up. And back in the day, it was lighters because they still could take lighters in these places. They were holding lighters up. And some people were taking their hands and they were waving their hands. And I was thinking, this is a rock and roll group. Why would you lift your hands to, to some human beings up there? But really, if that's all you have, they think we're foolish because we can't see what we have. We can't touch what we have. We can only feel it in our hearts. We can only know it by faith. Proverbs 14.9 says, Fools mock at sin, but among the upright, there is favor. Among the upright, there's favor. Fools can mock at sin, but among us, there's favor. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 31 says this, But God has chosen the foolish things of the, of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are not, or the things which are despised, God has chosen and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. You see, God has set everything up for us to glory in Christ, to, to know where our good stuff comes from. To know what the righteousness of God is in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 4, 17 through 18, it says this, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understandings darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. It says we all walked that way at one point in time. We all once walked in ignorance, our minds being darkness. But Jesus is the light of the world. Paul tells us to have the eyes of our understanding being enlightened so that we can see all the good things of God. If we look for grace, we will find grace. Seeing involves an awakening of the heart to know the good things of God. Listen, if, if, we, if we look for failure, if we look for God not to do the things he promised, if everything that we read in the scriptures, we're going, well, I hope so, which, by the way, we don't mean the meaning I hope I talked about on Sunday to where it's a, it's a confident expectation. It is a knowledge it's going to happen. 
if if we have the wish side of this thing, well, I wished for that. I wished it could happen. That's really what we're saying. We're we're wishing. If that's really what we have, then we don't have much. If we look for grace, if we look for God's favor, even in the midst of darkness, we're going to find light. Yeah, Mike, that's a great point. Uh, Mike Kelker says, this is what separates us from the world. Fools need something tangible where we are anchored in Christ and Jesus and the promises of God. That's exactly right. We know what we believe. People without Jesus don't know what they believe. That's why they wish for things to happen. But I find today in, in our world, because so many believers don't really know this Old Testament, they don't really know how God moved to the children of Israel and how he talked to them, how Jesus showed up, because they don't see all that and they don't know it and understand it, they spend a lot of time wishing things would happen. We're not interested in wishing things would happen. What we're interested in is knowing that God is going to do exactly what he said his word out to accomplish. It will happen in our life because he is God and his word does not return back to him void, but it shall accomplish everything that he sent it forth to accomplish. Yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Look for the positive. But, but it's so much more than just looking for positive. It's looking for God. We have to look for God. We have to look for the presence of God. In everything we do, there God will show up. You say, well, has he done that in your life? Yeah, all the time. Now, do I always recognize it right off the bat? No. I mean, I've done a lot of foolish things in my life, and I've made a lot of big errors. But that's the great part about it. God knew I would make the great error. And he already made provision for the recovery from the error. That's favor. That's how his favor works. And he did it over and over and over. Listen, for 40 years in the desert, he did it with the children of Israel. They make a mistake, he'd fix it. They'd make another mistake. He'd fix it. They'd tell him they couldn't stand being where they were at. They didn't like eating meat anymore. He'd say, okay, I'm listen, or eating uh, uh, manna anymore. He said, listen, I'm going to give you some meat. He dumped more meat on them than they could eat. They were throwing it up through their nostrils and, and, and out their mouths. And, and God told them, he, he said, see, if you ask me for something, I'm giving it to you in abundance. You got to start learning where God's at. Yeah, our eyes have been opened. And, and you're right, Ed. When we see salvation, we're no longer ignorant. We now can see. We just have to have that, those blinders taken off our eyes. And yet, Jesus is very positive. And the devil is very negative. But at the same time, Sometimes the circumstances of our life seem very, very on the negative. And, and that's the very time, just like we're seeing here with the children of Israel, in this account of them being backed up to the Red Sea, that's the very time that we look and say, where's God? Not, oh, where's God? Not that, but where are you, God? I know you're here. I'm going to look for you till you show up and move this mountain. Take me across this dry sea. Take me to the place you want me to be. Now let's take a look at Exodus 15, 23 through 26. Now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it is called Mara. Mara simply means bitter. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What well, shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, 
and there he tested them. Now, most likely, these waters had a bitter taste and a bitter smell. Have you ever been at a sulfur spring? Oh, man. It, it, it smells like somebody had a bad night with the, the, or a bad day the day before with pizza. It's bad. Um, yeah, they stink. Like rotten eggs and stuff, right? And, and the taste isn't any better. Right around the region where they were at, there, there were some sulfur springs there. And, and there still is to this day. There, and and there's, it's known that there are a lot of sulfur in the water in that there. Well, these waters, the Mara, there, were, there was lots of water there. And you remember, they're in the desert, lots of water there at Mara, but it was all bitter. And it had a, it had a nasty smell to it. Um, possibly, it could have been from the salt content as well, because a lot of salt, like the Dead Sea, you can float on it without trying. Anybody can float on it because there's so much salt content. Um, so either way, we know the waters, they couldn't drink them. And what's interesting is they're passing through this on the way to the wilderness. They're getting thirsty. They, you know, they want something. But take a look at what God does with them. Because you notice here, Mara is bitter water. And he said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases. Wait a minute. I think I'm in the, I think I'm, I skipped a verse here. Oh, okay. Move on. This is the last part of that verse where the Lord tells him. If, if you'll do all this stuff, I will have all the sicknesses and diseases that I brought on the Egyptians. I'm going to ha have them pass by you, for I am the Lord that heals you. This is the first time we find this, where he says, I am Jehovah Rapha, or the Lord, our healer. Now, you say, well, why would he say that after they were complaining about the drinking of the water? Because it's bitter water. But let, let me show you. Verse 25 says, it is here that the Lord tests them. Does the Lord, first of all, does the Lord ever test us? Does, does he check us out to find out what we believe? Yeah, he does. Often. What do you think this is teaching us? What's being taught here to us when, when the, it says that the Lord tests them there? Yeah, exactly, Richard. He, he already knows. Yeah, he tests us every day. You're exactly right. He he's he says, now he takes them to this place, or he's taking them by this place. The waters are bitter. How often have you gone past something in your life, or you're going past something in your life, or through something in your life, and the waters there are bitter? What, what you're experiencing is not sweet. It doesn't smell good. doesn't taste good. Yeah, plenty of times, right, Ed? So here it says that the Lord tests them. Ed said, or Mike says, the Lord is saying, do you believe in me and I will do what I say? That's, that's exactly what the Lord is asking them. Do you believe in me? Do you believe? But, but he's asking us that all the time. There's all kinds of things in our life where the Lord is asking us the same thing. Do you believe that I am who I say I am? Do you believe Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe that he is the peace that passes all understanding? Do you believe that he's joy? Well, the Lord's asking us that all the time. And as believers, what our response ought to be is we go forward, right? We say, yep, the Lord is my joy. I don't care what the situation is. The circumstance might be bad, but I know ultimately the the Lord is my joy. And so I need to look for the Lord there. The question here is, will they keep, that's the Hebrew meaning to, to, to guard or to hedge about or to protect, all his commands and enactments? When the Lord says, keep my commands and my statutes, he's saying, 
Will you hedge about them? Will you protect them? What I'm telling you, will you protect it? Not will you keep it. You understand what I'm saying? But will you protect it? All his commands and enactments. The result of their obedience is divine health. Think about that for us believers. Notice also that he says he puts the diseases on the Egyptians. He, he allowed those diseases. Listen, the, we already went through this in previous chapters. The Lord created everything. He knew those sicknesses and diseases were there. He held them off of the children of Israel. He allowed them to go and attack the Egyptians. He says, I'm not going to allow any of that to attack you. If you'll just trust me. Yeah, and when we do every day, when we see with our eyes, and when we hear with our ears, be honest with you, we believe in him and, and he will not allow us to be tempted beyond our limits. He never will. That's a great point, Mike. God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you, what you are able. If you will keep that in your mind, if you will keep that in your heart, then you will understand where, where God was trying to lead the children of Israel and what God was trying to lead them into. He, he's giving them a great word here that they need to follow. Now take a look at Exodus 16. Three through four. And, and, and I want you to also take a look. Let me just go back there for a second because I want you to see this. Um, there's a real obvious reference here to Christ. The waters are bitter. God gives them a tree. The tree goes into the water, makes the water sweet. Tree. Any other place in scripture where a tree happens to show up that takes the bitterness of men's life and turns it back into sweetness? Seems to me like I might know another place. Yeah, Ed, you get the prize for the night, the cross. And, and that's exactly what happens with believers. If we'll keep focused on the cross instead of the bitter water, he, that's what he told Moses. Take the take the the uh, take the tree, put the tree in the water. You want to sweeten up whatever the bitterness is around you. Put the cross into it. Bring the cross into it. Yeah, the serpent on the pole is another great example, Richard. The serpent on the pole. God gives us that over and over and over again. Where are we going to keep our eyes at? Not a cross filled with Jesus, a cross empty because Jesus has already beaten it. A, a, a cross that uh, he, where we can look at it and say he's already bore our sicknesses and our diseases. And by his stripes, we are healed. A cross that says we have received, not we're going to receive. A, a cross that already says our enemies are put under our feet. Take a look here at Exodus 16. Three through four. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of, of Egypt. When we sat by the post of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. Boy, does this sound like a church meeting? Um, <clears throat> For you brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them. Whether they will walk in my law or not. Here we find it again in Exodus 16. Is the Lord going to test them? He does. But what is the testing? We see the exact same phrase regarding God testing them. Somebody tell me, what, what is the test that he's bringing to them? Seeing who's listening and who's obeying. That's a good one, Ed. It is, the, is the test where God's wanting them to fail? Is the test ever about failure? 
it, taking only what the Lord says. Yeah, find out who's who's really listening. He's wanting to know if they're going to walk out his law or not. He's wanting to know if they're going to stick with him or not, if they're going to love him or not, if they're going to allow him to be their God or not. And and the the thing is, the Lord rains down heaven from, I mean, every day he's raining down heaven or bread from heaven. And he says he's testing them on whether they're going to do the right thing or not. In the Torah, which is, that's the word law, um, its meaning is a precept or statute. It comes from two words, yara or yara, with an H on the end of it, meaning to flow as in water flowing. The transition then is to lay out as in shooting an arrow, but figuratively to teach or to point out. So if you think about yara, the way the Hebrews put their, their letters together or their words together, um, this word yara means to flow as in water flowing. Water water's flowing through a creek or through a river. They transition that to mean to lay out as in shooting an arrow. Um, in other words, to teach. We're, we're going to point you in a direction. We're going to have you flow in a direction. Get it? That That's what the word yara means. Whereas the Hebrew letters spell out work is the beginning of revelation or power. That's literally what the uh, the letters spell out. Work is the beginning of revelation or power. Torah means the sign is the beginning of revelation. The actual word Torah means the sign is the beginning of revelation. Yara means work is the beginning of revelation or power. Torah means the sign that the first letter uh, to sit, it's it's a, like a TS sound, um, means um, the beginning, the sign that it's uh, the actual picture originally was a cross or an X, like a St. Andrew's cross. And, and it um, means that the sign is the beginning of revelation. So when you talk about the Torah, we're, we're talking about the sign is the beginning of revelation. Noash means to test, but implies to attempt. Not to test, but to attempt. Its Hebrew letters spell out the heir or offspring grabs or protects revelation. Now think about that. God tells them to keep his law in his statutes, right? Keep his Torah. Now, <clears throat> and he says, this is when he's going to test them. So he says, keep, when he's talking about keep, the sign is the beginning of revelation. Keep the sign that I'm giving you because the sign that I'm giving you is going to be the beginning of revelation for your mind. So when he tells them that he's not going to put any sickness or disease on them, and when he tells them that he's going to rain down bread from heaven, and he's going to test them, the sign, what? The bread from heaven is the beginning of revelation. Revelation about what? Revelation about God. What was the Ten Commandments? The Torah. It was the revelation. It was the sign of the revelation of who God is. God's trying to explain to them who he is. So he said, hey, listen, you got to keep this sign. You got to keep this revelation about me and about everything that I show you. Yet now we do have Christ, and it wasn't working with them because they kept refusing it. That's why when he says he's going to test them, that word nasa, which means to test, it implies to attempt. He's, he's saying, hey, women, I, I want you guys to attempt this. But his Hebrew letters spell out that the heir or the offspring grabs or protects the revelation. That's actually what, when it talks about testing, it is actually, this is what the letters spell out. Because in Hebrew, every single letter has its own meaning. It, it has its own 
uh, character, meaning, story behind it. When you put all of those letters together, you actually get what that one word that those letters make up, you get what that word is supposed to mean. Well, in this case, in Na NASA, it, it actually means to test, but implies to attempt. But the letters actually spell out the heir, the offspring, me, you, we grab or we protect the revelation. So when he's when he's telling them he's going to test them, what's he wanting them to do? He's wanting them to grab a hold of the revelation and protect it. When um, James talks about the Lord testing us in James chapter one, he tells us the Lord is testing us, but what is the Lord doing? I'm giving you revelation. Hang on to it. Hang on to the revelation that you get. Protect the revelation. You're the heir to the throne. Protect the revelation. Yeah, Ed, there is a bunch of slow learners out there. We, we're some of them, right? The revelation gives you knowledge. That's exactly right, Mike, that you didn't have in the beginning. That's the difference between rhema and logos. Rhema is when you get a word from the Lord, it is, it is yours because you got revelation of that word. It's not just the general knowledge of the word of God. So many people live in just general knowledge, but we don't want to, we want to get beyond just the general knowledge of the word of God. We want to get to the rhema where the word of God becomes alive and real in our hearts, where the word of God, just like he's talking to the children of Israel here, listen, where it rains manna from heaven where the water that's bitter turns sweet. That's the kind of revelation that we want to get, and then we want to hang on to it. We want to protect it. So the test is always Jesus. He is. He's the test. He's the seed that took the, the thorns for us so that we could receive favor. He wants to know if we will walk. It's the Hebrew word halak in his Torah. He wants to know if we're going to walk in, in, in the word. That's what it talks about in, in the scriptures. We're going to walk in the New Testament. We're going to walk by faith. We often think of walking in something religious as a strict adherence to what's required. To Walking is some strict adherence to some law. If I'm walking in faith, I am strictly not wavering in what I believe. That's what it means to walk in faith. I'm strictly not wavering in what I believe. To walk in the law would mean not wavering from any one law, i.e. the rich and ruler, right? But when we look at the pictures of halak, the Hebrew letters for halak, it starts with grace. It starts with a hey, which is grace. We see it starts with revelation. Grace, revelation. They, grace and revelation are one and the same thing with God. The more we understand him, the more grace we have, the more favor we have, because we can access more favor. Literally, the picture of the word halak, to walk in his law, literally that picture spells out revelation or favor prods toward what is allowed. Woo, get that? When he says, are you going to walk in my law? You're going to walk in my statue. You're going to walk in my covenant. How about you're going to walk in faith? In Hebrew, it literally spells out revelation or favor prods toward what is allowed. God, when we're walking with him, he is prodding us toward what he allows. Now, to get an understanding, we need to see what God is really trying or testing them about. Will they gain revelation of the sign that is the beginning of revelation regarding their redemption? Are they going to get revelation? Are they going to get uh, the revelation they need to understand the signs he is giving them, the manna from heaven, the tree putting being put into the water? Are they going to get that all of that is working toward their redemption? Are they going to get an understanding of his favor as he protects them and keeps them? And will they protect and keep the revelation of God's favor? 
That's all he wants them to do, really, is keep the revelation of his favor. Man, if we can imagine that for ourselves, that in our salvation, all God wants us to do is keep the revelation of his favor for us. Armed with this information, take a look at Exodus 15, 25 again. It says, God made at Mara a statute and an ordinance. Then he asked them to listen attentively to his commandments and his statutes. Statutes is, is the word uh, chalk, meaning an enactment, hence an appointment. The letters spell out separate what is behind. In other words, what's behind? Ordinance is mishpat, meaning a verdict. The letters spell out mighty consumes mouth surrounds. Mighty consumes what the mouth surrounds. When you're talking about an ordinance of God, right? An ordinance is the mighty consumes what the mouth surrounds. It, my words. I'm going to speak the word. I'm going to speak the word of revelation. I'm going to speak the word of God because in speaking the word of God, things happen. Will they give ear to God's mitzvah, his commandments? This one sp spells out the mighty pulls towards secured revelation. The word mitzvah actually means the mighty pulls toward revelation or grace. Everything God is telling them is meant to pull them toward knowing him in his mighty power so that they can see and receive great grace, great favor from him. Yet, yeah, that, Richard, that's a good word. My word is alive and full of power to accomplish that which I desire. That's exactly what God, that's all God's trying to show them here the whole time. He's just showing. But think about what he's telling us when he's talking to us about his own word. When he talks to us about Jesus, when he talks about knowing Jesus, everything that the New Testament tells us is the same as the Old Testament. It is all moving us toward knowing him because the more we know of him, the more we can obtain favor because we know how to access it. We know how to grab hold of it. We know how to keep it. We know how to surround it in our life. That's what God's showing us here in this. Look at John 7, 28 through 29. This is Jesus talking. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, you both know me and you know where I am from. And I have come from my father and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him for I'm from him and he sent me. Jesus knows the father because he's from the father. Everything he teaches his disciples is for them to know the Father as well. This is the message God was giving the Hebrew people when they came to the bitter water. It wasn't an accident that they were making the decision to not receive God's favor at the bitter water. The tree, Jesus' cross, would make the water sweet. They understood it was bitter water. I mean, who wants to... Who wants to be out in the desert? But God's able to make it sweet. Jesus answers John 8, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. If it is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God, yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees here, and he's talking to people who know the law, and they claim the law, and they claim they have Jehovah as their God, and yet they don't know him at all. They merely follow their interpretation of what they want him to say. That's all they're doing. So many Christians live just like that. They follow an interpretation that's of the Bible that says what they want God to say. But Jesus actually knows the Father's heart. He speaks from the, from the heart of the Father, which allows him to keep the Father's word. 
He knows exactly where he's going all the time. He knows where it's going to take them. As in the lives of everyone who believes, the bitterness of a law that binds is made sweet by understanding the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church has got to move away from knowing the law, but not knowing the heart of the lawgiver. The picture God is giving Israel at Marah is one of redemption and favor. They interpret because of their own pride that is ordinances, rules, and laws. The test is not will they obey, but will they believe? Will they truly trust the God of their father Abraham? How have you been affected by your walk with religion? How have you been how have you been affected by your walk in religion? Yeah, Mike, that's always the way it is. The religious leaders always want power. <laughs> they don't want mercy and grace. They want power. Have you ever had times in your life where the um, where the gospel just seemed like it was a little bitter at the moment? But how was it made sweet? What did Jesus do or what did you experience or what did you learn through the course of going through anything where you apply the cross to it and it comes out sweet? That's how it works. That's the favor of Jesus. That's the favor he gives us. Yeah, submit to the Holy Ghost. That's right, Ed. He's going to teach us. Well, I appreciate you all joining us tonight. We had, I hope you got something out of the lesson tonight. A good time teaching it. You guys can send me emails later saying, you know, no, I didn't like any of it, Pastor. That's okay. No, we listen. We want you to have a great time, a great week. Ah, you joined by sound only, Mike. Well, good. Good thing I read those scriptures to you then. Uh, yeah, my. For whatever reason, my internet signal wasn't very strong tonight either. So, listen, you all be blessed. Go in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a great week, what's left of it. I will see you guys on Sunday morning. We're going to have a great service. One more week of doing Sundays like we've been, and then we're off to the races at, at church. Got a lot of things being done there. It's awesome. The, the roof is being put on the back. The room's being finished. It should all be done by the time we get back. Amen. And we'll have a great time. Be ready to shout. Y'all have a great night. Be blessed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.